Hello, my name is Kyle, and in this video, we'll be going over the core fundamentals of using the game framework Love2D. We'll start off by talking through the process of installing Love and getting your programming environment set up. Then we'll talk more about how projects are organized with Love. And finally, most of this video will be dedicated to creating a simple game from scratch. While working on this game, we'll go over some key features of Love including the core load, update, and draw functions, getting the structure of our game set up, displaying shapes, modifying colors, and reading mouse input from the player. Covering these basic concepts will give you a great understanding of how love works as a whole. So when you're ready, let's get started. The first thing that we'll be doing is installing love. This is very easy. You just go to love2d.org and the download links are right here. Just choose the appropriate link for your operating system. If you're on Windows, I recommend the installer. When it's done downloading, go ahead and run it. And just go through the steps. Next, I agree. Make sure you keep track of this destination folder. We will be visiting this path in just a moment. Choose next, and then finish. One thing I would recommend for you to do is to create a shortcut to Love on your desktop. Or if you're on Mac, just add the Love application to your dock. But for Windows, it's best to create a shortcut. To do this, you just go to the path where you installed Love, which for me, it was C Program Files Love, and then you're going to find the love.exe, or it might just be called Love if you can't see the file name extensions. It's an application file. Right click on it, choose Send to Desktop, and then it creates a shortcut. To double check that this works, you can go ahead and run the shortcut, and it should pop up some Love window, and it should say No Game. It might not look exactly like this, but any Love window should mean that this is working. Love is a pretty simple program to work with. And the reason I say this is because there is no interface to deal with or an editor that takes time and getting used to. In fact, a completely viable way of programming with Love is to do all of your programming in any text editor. But if you want my opinion on what the best way to work with Love is, it's to use Visual Studio Code. VS Code is a lightweight text editor built with programmers in mind. There's all kinds of built-in helpful tools that make programming a lot easier, and there's also tons of packages that you can install that provide additional features. In our case, we're going to be using a package catered to Love2D and Lua. Now keep in mind that this step is completely optional. You can use any text editor you want to write Lua code and Love2D games. I personally find VS Code to currently be the best option for Love development, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how to set it up. The installation process is very simple. You can search online for Visual Studio Code, or you can go directly to code.visualstudio.com, and then you're going to install this program for your operating system. This will work fine even if you're on Mac. I'm going to demonstrate this on Windows. And let's run this. When you're installing, I'm going to go ahead and create a desktop icon as well, and install. And it's done, so let's go ahead and open up Visual Studio Code. This is what it should look like as soon as you start it up. How it works is you can open any file or folder in this program, and it'll let you directly edit the file contents. So it'll let us write our Lua code very easily. In order to run our Lua code directly with Love, though, it'll be helpful to have a certain extension installed. VS Code allows us to install extensions, which are just some extra tools that help with certain tasks. To install an extension, we're just going to go over here to this button, click it, and then we're going to search for the extension that we want to install. If we just search for Love2D, the first option should be Love2D support, and this is the one we want. I'm going to click Install, and you'll know it installed as soon as you see this Uninstall button. What this extension does is it gives us some added support for Love2D projects, but most of all, it lets us easily run Love2D code directly from our editor. Before we close out of this, we do need to check some settings on this extension. So we go over here to this little gear icon, and we're going to choose Extension Settings. 
there's a few things we can check on here, but the main thing that we want to look at is this love2d path. This is the path to love.exe. When you installed love, it installed to some directory on your computer. And this is the path that we looked at last time in order to create our shortcut. For me, it is C program files love love.exe. And I encourage you to go to this path in a file explorer or something and verify that there is a love.exe in this folder. If there isn't, then you'll need to reinstall love. So when you have this box accurate, we'll be testing this out actually in the next lecture, but first we'll need some sample code to run. So when you're all ready, you can go ahead and close out of all this stuff and you can move on to the next lecture where we will talk about setting up a love project. So if you haven't already, go ahead and run love as it is by double clicking on the shortcut and you'll be greeted with some weird looking love 2D window. It might not look exactly like mine depending on your version, but I can guarantee it'll be something a little weird. What this screen means is that love is running but no game files were found. And this makes sense. Love needs some actual code from us before it can do anything. So once you're done watching this, you can go ahead and close out of it. Now, this next part is very important. Games made with love have a particular folder structure in order for them to work. Luckily for us though, it's really easy and straightforward. First, you need to make a new folder. This can be anywhere on your computer. I'm gonna put mine right on the desktop. Right click new folder, and then you're going to give it a name. I would recommend naming it either the name of your game or your project. I'm going to call mine test project. Next inside of this folder, we're going to create a new file. So I'm going to right click new, and it's going to be a text document at first, but we're going to be changing it from a .txt to a Lua file, and it has to be called main.lua and yes we do want to change the extension if you cannot see the extension of the file you can go up to view and then there is a file name extensions box that you can click once you have this file created everything is set up and ready to go like i said at the start of the section love utilizes lua code in order for us to create games and this will be our first example of showing that in action now, if we want to open this project in our development environment, in my case, I'm using Visual Studio Code, I'm going to start the program and then I'm going to go to File, Open Folder. And then now I need to navigate to wherever I had that folder. In my case, I had it on the desktop. And here it is, Test Project. So I'm going to choose this folder and then choose Select Folder. And now our project is open in Visual Studio Code. We can see our main.lua file that we just created, and if we double click on it, it opens up the file and we're able to edit its contents. Now that we have a project with the correct structure, we can actually run this as is. In order to run a love game, you have several options. A surefire way is to take your project folder, click and drag it directly onto love, like this. And if it works, you'll get a black screen that says untitled at the top. This is normal. The game project we made is running. It's just that since our main.lua has nothing in it, that means that nothing is going to happen. Another option to run your games, which you will probably prefer, is to run the project within Visual Studio Code itself. If you have your project open like this, you can use the hotkey Alt-L, and it'll take your code and run it through Lua, just like before. Keep in mind that this requires you to have the setup steps from the previous lecture. So if Alt plus L isn't working for you in Visual Studio Code, take another look at the previous lecture to see if you miss any steps. As I've mentioned, Love utilizes the programming language Lua to do all of the coding. If you haven't used Lua before, I recommend checking out my full course on udemy.com called Lua Programming and Game Development with Love. This course features a full section discussing Lua, teaching you everything you need to know in order to start programming your own games. The whole course assumes no prior technical knowledge, so if you've never programmed before, it'll be perfect for you. But even if you do have experience programming, it'll be a great way to become more familiarized with the language, 
especially with the tricky concepts like tables, which are important data structures that are unique to Lua. There's a link to the course in the description, and using this link will automatically apply a discount code, so be sure to check it out. Now that Love is installed and everything is ready to go, we can start talking through Love fundamentals and get started with making our basic project, which will look like this. Just a quick demonstration of the game window, drawing graphics and text, and receiving input from the player. Since this is a brand new project with a brand new main.lua file, we don't have any code yet. Now, whenever I start a new game with love, I always start by putting in the three main functions that make our game work, and that's the load function, the update function, and the draw function. Let's go through these one by one. First, we got function love.load. This is what this function will look like in our code. Since we see that this function has love in it, it's clear that we're going to start working with the features that the love game engine has to offer. For this function in particular, it's going to run the moment that the game starts. So whatever we put in here before the end, that code is going to be run immediately when the game loads. And it's here that we're going to specify our global variables, adjust the window size, and perform any other preliminary setup before the game fully starts. The next function we have is function love.update. Notice that this function is a little bit different because this one has a parameter, dt. Essentially, love.update is going to be our game loop. In other words, this function is going to be called every frame that our game is running. Since by default, games made with love run at 60 frames per second, that means that the code that we put inside love.update will be run 60 times every second. Finally, we have our function love.draw. As the name implies, this function is used for drawing graphics to the screen. Basically, anything that the player sees on their screen is going to be a result of some code that we put inside this function. Draw is actually sort of similar to love.update, because it runs every single frame as well. However, it is very important to remember that draw is reserved for anything involving graphics and images. You shouldn't perform any calculations or declare any important variables in here. Let's do a simple example to help you get a better understanding of how these three functions interact with each other. In the load function, let's put in a new variable. I'm going to call it number, and I'm just going to set it equal to zero. Since this variable is declared in the load function, that means that this variable will exist from the moment that the game starts. Next, in the update function, let's update that number variable. We'll say number equals number plus one. Now, since this line of code exists inside the update function, that means that number is going to increase by one every single frame that the game is running. Finally, in the draw function, let's put in the following line, love.graphics.print, and we'll print out the value of number. We're just taking this value and printing it out to the screen. And keep in mind that in order for this print function to work, it has to be run within our love.draw function. So now you can go ahead and save and let's run. And although it's small, in the upper left hand corner, you'll be able to see the value of number. It's very quickly increasing by one every single frame. And since the game is running at about 60 frames per second, that means that the variable will be increasing by 60 every single second. This whole setup here is essentially how love games work. Major variables are declared up in love.load, the variables are altered in some way in love.update, and then using those variables, we're going to draw something to the screen in love.draw. With this fundamental concept understood, we are ready to move on. So far in this course, the only thing that we've drawn to the screen has been text. Now, unless you're wanting to make some kind of text-based adventure sort of game, 
you're probably going to want to have actual graphics. In order to slowly introduce ourselves to how using graphics works, we're going to start off by using simple shapes, before moving on to showing real sprites or images. Let's first start by getting rid of the code that we included in these functions in the previous lecture, since that was just for a short demonstration. Now, we're going to start off this lesson in the love.draw function. As mentioned in the previous lecture, it's in here that anything that we want to draw to the screen will go. Let's start by drawing a basic rectangle. We'll do love.graphics.rectangle. This is a function that love includes for us that, when used in the draw function, allows us to draw a rectangle. Now this function has several parameters that we'll need to take care of, and I'll explain what each of them means after we type them in. The first parameter is what's called the mode of the rectangle, which just specifies if we want our rectangle to be completely filled in, or if we want only an outline of a rectangle. We'll make this a filled rectangle, so the first parameter will be fill in quotation marks. The next two parameters are this rectangle's x and y position values in the game world, which for now, we'll just leave to be 0 and 0. Finally, the last two parameters are the rectangle's width and height. Go ahead and make these whatever you'd like, but I'm going to go ahead and do 200 for the width and 100 for the height. And that's it. With this function in place, we should expect to see a rectangle drawn to the screen. Now we'll just save and run, and there it is. Our rectangle is up here in the corner. As we specified in the function, this rectangle is filled in, and it's not just an outline. For reference, if we were to change this fill to line, like this, and then save and run, it is now just an outline of a rectangle. But I'm going to change this back and run again. The width and height parameters that we specified were 200 for the width, which we can see it moves to the right 200 pixels, and a height of 100, which is 100 pixels tall. Now the last thing to discuss here is the x and y position values of this rectangle. By x and y, I mean the location of the rectangle in the game world. Right now we have it set to be located at position 0, 0, which we specified with these parameters right here. The position 0, 0 is this upper left hand corner of our game window. See, the game world is one big grid, and every pixel on screen has its own coordinates, an x and y value. If you remember from your basic math classes, x refers to the horizontal location in a grid, and the y coordinate represents the vertical location. What might be a little bit different than you may remember is that in love, y increases downwards rather than upwards. For example, if we wanted to find the pixel coordinates at position 200, 400, we would look to the right 200 pixels and then down 400. And let's actually try this out. Back in the code, we can change this 0, 0 to, say, 200, 400. So now our rectangle will be located at the position x equals 200 and y equals 400. And we can save and run once more, and there it is. We see that our rectangle has moved to this new position. Essentially, its x value changed from here, 0, 0, to 200 to the right and 400 pixels down, making its new position right here. And also should clarify that the x and y position of a rectangle is its upper left corner, so this point right here. Then we specified the width and the height to be 200, 100, and that width stretches to the right from the position and down from that position as well. A great thing about love is that it comes with so many helpful tools for us as programmers that make our jobs easier, just like this rectangle function right here. It would take a lot more code and a lot more time just for us to get to this point with one white rectangle in a game window. Love offers so many functions and features that make game development much simpler. And you can take a look for yourself. Open up an internet browser and go to this page 
love2d.org slash wiki. On this site, there's all kinds of information about what Love has to offer. But what you'll find most useful is this section on the side, the documentation. Here, every function that Love comes with is outlined and explained thoroughly, so you'll always be able to figure out how something works or how to use it. For now, since we're focusing on drawing graphics, let's click on this love.graphics section. Here, if we scroll down, we'll see a huge list of all the different types and all the different functions that come with love.graphics. In this functions section, under functions drawing, we can see all kinds of simple shapes like love.graphics.circle or triangle, or there's also the function we were working with, love.graphics.rectangle. And let's try clicking on this one. What we get is a very detailed overview of what this function does and how it works. Up at the very top, it simply tells us it draws a rectangle. Following this, it comes with this synopsis section, which tells us what each of the different parameters mean and how to use them. It's the same parameters that we defined in our file. We had mode, x, y, width, and height. So if you're dealing with a function in love, and you forget how to use it, or you don't remember which parameters you need to specify, you can just go to the love wiki, and you can just search for the function. Or even easier, you could just type love 2 d rectangle into Google or something, and the first result will most likely be this page. Each of these pages even have examples, if you go all the way down to the bottom, that show an example of this function being used in action. So be sure to take advantage of that if you ever need additional help because sometimes it won't always be completely clear just looking at the documentation. Now, the game we're working on right now involves clicking on targets that will pop up on the screen, which will momentarily replace with simple circles. So let's go back a screen, and let's scroll up to find love.graphics.circle. Before we use this function, let's take a look at the parameters. We got the mode, which is the same deal as with the rectangle where it defines if it's filled in or just an outline. We got the X and Y position, and we have the radius. Let's go back into our code and try it out. We'll type in love.graphics.circle, and our mode, I'm going to choose fill again. Our position, I'll keep at zero, zero for now. And the radius can be whatever you want. Uh, we'll start with 100. When we save and run, we'll see that our circle is being drawn in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. But most of it's cut off. This is because with circles, the position value is the center of the circle. So since the center is at position 0, 0, that means 3 quarters of the circle is being cut off. Let's change this position value to something like... 300, 200. Now let's save and run that. There we go. Now we can see the circle in its entirety. And you'll notice that the rectangle is still being drawn to the screen as well. And that's because we left this rectangle code in our draw function. In the next lecture, we'll give a bit of color to these shapes and talk a bit about what happens if these two shapes overlap with each other. Looking at just a black and white screen like this is getting kind of dull, so let's add some color. In programming, at least in most cases, color is defined by using a color model called RGB, which simply stands for red, green, and blue. These are the three main colors that computer or television screens use, and by mixing these colors together in certain ways, you can produce different colors. Sort of like how you can mix paints together to get different paint colors. And actually, every color can be represented by some combination of red, green, and blue, which is why programmers like to use RGB, because they can precisely get the exact shade that they're looking for. In Love, there is a very handy function called love.graphics.setColor. Feel free to look up this function in the documentation for more detailed information, but basically it accepts three parameters, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. Each of these colors will be given a value from 0 to 1, 0 being none of that color, 1 being as much as possible, 
and then for partial values, you will use a decimal value. For example, if I did the combination 0, 0, 1, that would give us a very blue color, since the third parameter is for blue, and we set it to the maximum amount. Or if we did 1, 1, 0, that would give us a very bright yellow color, because we maxed out red and green and used no blue, and red and green make yellow. And like I mentioned earlier, we could use partial amounts, so let's say we set green to 0.4. This would give the resulting color more of an orange color, since it's less green. Let's go ahead and start things off by adding a call to love.graphics.setColor. And for the parameters, put in whatever combination of red, green, and blue that you prefer. For now, I'm going to go with 0, 1, and 0, which should give us a strong green color. When we save and run the game, you'll see that both of these shapes that were white before are now green. In case you're wondering why both of the shapes changed colors, it's because when you call set color, everything else in the draw function will be affected by that color shift. By default, the draw function sets the color to white, which is why we were originally seeing the white shapes in our game. Let's try making our shapes different colors. After the rectangle function is called, let's go ahead and call another love.graphics.setColor. And this time I'm going to make the color 1 and 0 0.63 and 0. Now go ahead and save and run the program. As you'll see, both shapes have their own colors. This is because in our code, we started off by setting the color to green, which then we called the rectangle. After that, we changed the color over to this orange shade, and then we drew the circle. The shapes were drawn while the color was set to something different for both of them. Here's a little thought. What would happen if these shapes were drawn at the same location? What if the rectangle was actually drawn up here towards where the circle is? We can actually test this out real quick. If we change the rectangle's Y position right here to something higher, like 250, higher up on the screen, if I save and run, we'll see that the circle overlaps the rectangle. Well, this raises another question. Why is the circle on top rather than the rectangle? Well, it comes down to the drawing order. If we look at our code in the draw function, we drew the rectangle and then we drew the circle. Since the rectangle was drawn first, the circle that gets drawn afterwards just draws over top of it. Think of it like pieces of paper. I first put the rectangular piece of paper on my desk, and then I put the circular piece of paper on top of it. Of course, since I put down the circle after the rectangle, the circle will be on top. The same concept applies here. It's important to be mindful of what order you draw everything in, so that important graphics don't get drawn over. Before wrapping up this lecture, if the concept of RGB is new to you, I recommend checking out the W3Schools Color Picker page for more detail about creating colors. You'll notice here that if I choose a color, and then I look down here to the RGB section, the scale is actually represented on a scale of 0 to 255. This is actually typical. RGB normally is represented on a 0 to 255 scale. Love used to do the same thing, but in version 11 of Love, they switched over to the 0 to 1 scale that's used today. So if you're playing around with this picker and choosing colors that you want to try out in your Love games, you could just take these values here, copy them, and if you wanted to use this exact same color, you could paste them into the setColor function, but then divide each one by 255. So we can divide all three of these values by 255. That would transition it from the 255 scale to the 0 to 1 scale. Now that we have a firm understanding of how graphics work in love, let's move on to start implementing some gameplay elements. So in this game, there will be a circular target that appears on the screen, and the player will have to click it as fast as they can. Once they click it, it will reappear at a different spot on the screen. Each time they have a successful click, their score goes up. In order to easily coordinate the setup for the target, we are going to be making a target table 
that stores a few values for us. If we keep all the values related to the target in one table, it will be easier to manage and remember where everything is stored. So, in order to do this, we'll initialize our table in the load function. As you may remember, the load function executes immediately when the game begins. So this is the perfect spot for us to put this table. We'll write target equals empty table. Now, this is the table that we'll refer to whenever we want to talk about this main circle target. Now this target needs to have a position, so let's give it a target.x, and we'll start it off at 0, and a target.y, also starting off at 0. One last thing that this target needs is a size. Since our target is a circle, we need to store the value for the radius. For now, let's make target.radius equal 50. This about covers the main aspects of our target. So let's go down to the draw function and use these new values to actually draw this target table that we just created. And we actually do not need any of this stuff right now, so we'll get rid of it. We'll use the love.graphics.circle function. We'll want our target to be filled, but this time we're going to make the position for the circle to be target.x and target.y. And also we're going to use target.radius for the radius of this circle. Instead of filling in specific values for this x, y, and radius position like we were doing before, we're using our variable values from the table. This makes things much more clear what values these represent. Now in addition to just drawing a circle, it would be nice to have some color. So I'm also going to include a love.graphics.setColor and we'll make our target red. So I'm going to make it 1, 0, 0. Now if you save and run, we'll see a little bit of this circle in the upper left hand corner. Same issue as before, our target is currently located at position 0, 0, which means that this position right here is its center. We can move this out of the way so we can see it a little bit better by adjusting these values right here. I'm going to put the target at position 300, 300. Keep in mind that we're not adjusting this draw function, this circle function, at all. All we're doing is adjusting the target.x and target.y values, which in turn adjust these values right here. So if I save and run once more, our target has moved to a more visible position. Now that we have this in place, let's go ahead and specify our global variables. Besides the target itself, there are two values that the game will keep track for us, and that's the score, which we'll specify here. Score, we'll start off at zero, which will increase each time we hit a target, and also the timer, which will count down in real time during gameplay. For now, we can initialize both of these to zero. And that's all we really need for now. We'll flush out the functionality for these values in later lectures. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about how we can incorporate the mouse into this game. When we click on this circle, which is currently representing the target, we want our score to increase. So let's go through how to do this. We have our score variable right here. So what we can do is print it out. Down here in love.draw, we're going to do love.graphics.print, and we're going to print out score at position 0, 0. This will put the value of score in the upper left hand corner. So let's save and run, and you'll notice a few things. First, the score value is very, very small and hard to read and also it's the same color as our button. Let's fix these issues now. First, regarding the color, in order to fix that, we need a new set color call right before we print our text. That's simply done by doing love.graphics.setColor, and then we want to make it white, so that's one, one, one. 
maxing out all three values results in white. And we can check this. The text is now white. Now let's work on making it bigger, which we'll just need to change the font. Up in our load function, let's create a new font. We'll do game font equals love.graphics.new font with two parentheses. Whatever number we put in here, let's try 40, is going to be the new font size for this game font. If you look at the documentation for this new font function, there are actually some optional parameters that you can put in here as well, one of them being an external font file. Say you want your font to be different from the default Love2D font. You can include a .ttf or otf with your game and then reference it in this function. We'll be doing this in a later game, but for now using the default font is just fine. So now that we have our new game font, we just need to set the font love.graphics.setFont, and the font we want to set the game to is game font. Now, if we save and run, our text for the score is much more readable now. And if you want it to be bigger or smaller, you can adjust that number in the new font call. One thing to notice is that this set font call works very similarly to these set color calls. All font related drawing after this point will be affected by this font change. So if you want multiple fonts in your game, you'll need to call the setFont function before each of your print statements. Now that we can clearly see our score at the top, we're going to go through and see how we can click on that target. We're going to be using Love's mouse pressed function. If you go to the wiki and you search for mouse pressed, you'll be able to find this page on this function that we'll be using. This is love.mousepressed. And the way it works is we can actually copy this whole function, go back to our code, and at the bottom, we'll type function and then paste this all in and put end. I know the way that we're setting this up is a little bit different than what you might be used to, but bear with me. I'll go through exactly what's happening after we're done. With this function in place, we're ready to start adding code to it. The way we use love.mousepressed is a little bit different than the way we've used a lot of the other functions. Here what we're doing is we copied this declaration and what we're going to do is add our own code to this function so that whenever the mouse is pressed, our custom code will be run. We want to know when the user clicks their mouse so we can determine if they clicked on the target or not. These parameters up here help us accomplish this. The X and Y parameters represent the mouse's current position when the mouse is pressed, or when you click a key on your mouse. The button tells us which button on your mouse was clicked. And these isTouch and presses parameters are not very important to us right now. Those are just used for mobile, but we'll worry about those later. Right now we're focusing on these first three. To reiterate, what we're trying to accomplish here is whenever the player clicks the mouse, particularly the left mouse button, we want to increase the score if it's over top the target. So we're going to be utilizing this button parameter to verify that the button that was clicked was the left mouse button. To accomplish this, we're actually going to utilize an if statement. We can do if button is equal to 1, then, and the reason we're checking to see if button is equal to 1 is, we can go back to the documentation, this documentation gives us an overview of the parameters. We can see this button parameter, and it says here specifically that one is the primary mouse button, or the left click. Two is the secondary mouse button, and three is the middle button. So in our case, we want to make sure that button is equal to one before continuing on. So with this if statement, we're verifying that the button that was clicked is the left mouse button. And for now, if it is, let's increase the score. Score equals score plus one. And we can save and test this out as is. We'll run. If I click, we can see our score increase. However, you'll also notice that if you right click, nothing happens. And that's because we are checking that the button that was clicked was specifically the primary button. Any of the other buttons will not work. You will notice though that currently, I can click anywhere on the screen and our score will increase. 
when rather we want the score to only increase when we're clicking on the target itself. So in the next lecture, we're going to take care of that. We can currently click anywhere on our screen to increase the score, but for our game, we need it so that the score only increases when we click on the target, or inside of this circle here. Basically, we'll need to ask the question, when the player clicks the mouse, is the mouse located inside of the circle? If so, increase the score. Otherwise, don't do anything. This will require a little bit of math in order for us to figure this out. If we have the mouse's position, and we have the target's position, how can we verify that the mouse is located inside of the target's circle? Here is the target's x, y position value, right in the center of the circle. And at the mouse's tip is the mouse's x, y value. The other important information is the radius of the circle. It is this length. With all of this information, it might be easiest to measure how close the mouse is to the center of the circle. We have two points here. If the distance between these two points is less than the radius of the circle, then that means the mouse is located inside of the circle. For example, if the mouse is here, the distance between the center of the circle and the mouse is larger than the radius of the circle. So that means that it is outside the circle. But if the mouse was here, the distance between the center of the circle and the mouse is less than the radius of the circle. Turns out to be pretty simple logic. In order to implement this logic, we'll need to utilize the distance formula, which looks like this. What we're going to do is use this formula to calculate what the distance between the mouse's xy position and the target's xy position is. Then, if that distance is less than the radius of the circle, then we know that the mouse is inside the circle. The distance formula is not included with Lua or Love, so that means that we are going to have to write our own function that does this formula. Down at the bottom of our code, we're going to write a new function that will do this. We're going to call it function distance between. If we refer back to the distance formula, we can see that it uses four different values to determine distance. It needs the x and y of one point, and the x and y of another point. So that means our function is going to have four different parameters. It'll have x1, y1, x2, and y2, representing the two different xy coordinates. And then don't forget the end. Now, inside of this function, we are going to use these parameters to perform this calculation. What makes this tricky is that we somehow have to convert this formula into code, which is a bit weird, because how can we make this square root symbol, or these squared values? We'll go through how to do just that. Let's take this one step at a time. We'll start with the inner part of the square root. Let's take a look at this x2 minus x1 squared part. To do this, we'll simply put in x2 minus x1. Then we need to somehow take this to the power of 2. This is done pretty easily just with power of 2. And that takes care of the first part. This is essentially the same as this. So let's do the next part, which is actually pretty similar. We're going to add y2 minus y1 squared. And that's everything for this formula that's under the square root symbol which means all that's left is to actually square root everything that we have here. This is done by using the function root sqrt. And then we just need to put whatever we want to square root inside of its parentheses. So if I open the parentheses on this side and then put the closing parentheses on this side, that means all of this is contained within our root call. Now that this value is successfully calculated and it matches the real distance formula, we just need to return it. So we can say return. And although it was kind of tricky, we successfully implemented a function that calculates the distance between two points. Now that we have this function all ready to use, we can go back to our code inside of the mouse press function right here and utilize it. 
Now recall what we're trying to do here. We need to test to see if the distance between the center of the circle and the mouse is less than the radius. And if it is, that means we're inside of the circle. So let's give this a shot. First, I'm actually going to delete this line because we don't need it quite yet. And first off, I'd like to use the distance between function to actually get the distance between the mouse and the target at this point in the code. And I think it would be best to store this in a local variable. We'll say local mouse to target equals, and just as a reminder, we're using the local keyword here because this variable is only going to be used for this calculation and that's it. We don't need to make it global. Now to use the distance between function. We need to make a call to it, so we're going to say distance between, and then we need to provide all of the parameters for this function. Remember that the parameters are defined right here. x1, y1, x2, y2. It's just two separate points. And the points in question here are the mouse's position and the target's position. Let's start with the mouse's position. We actually have the mouse's position right here as parameters in love.mousepressed. So for x1, y1, we can clarify just x and y. And these refer to the mouse's xy position. Next, we need the target's x and y values, which we have stored as target.x and target.y. Pretty simple. So with those parameters in place, that means that after this function runs in our code, mouse to target is going to contain the distance between the mouse and the center of the circle. With this value ready to go, we now need to verify that this value is less than the radius before increasing the score. So this is going to require another if statement. We're going to say if mouse to target is less than target.radius then. Now one thing you'll notice here is we actually have an if statement inside of another if statement. What's going to happen is this if statement is going to run whenever the mouse is pressed. Then it's going to go on to this middle section, calculate the distance between the mouse and the circle, and then it's going to ask this question. So if this condition in here is true, if the mouse to target value is less than the radius of the target, that is when we want to increase score. Therefore, this line right here is only going to be reached if we're pressing the left mouse button and the distance between the target and the mouse is less than the radius. Finally, we're ready. We can go ahead and save and run. And now if I left click outside of the target, Nothing happens, but if I move the mouse inside of the target, our score will increase. And again, only if I'm left clicking. If I right click like this, nothing happens. Left click, it does work. And outside, nothing happens. I'm very happy to have this working, but this isn't much of a game yet. There's no challenge when the target stays in place like this the whole time. I can just repeatedly click on it. In the next lecture, we're going to work on making the target change to a different screen position every time it's clicked on. In the final game, we want to make it so that when the player presses on the target, it will jump to another position on the screen. Let's implement this now. The code that we're going to write is actually going to go right here, right after the score increases, because if the score increases, we know that it's okay to change the position of the target. And to do this, all we need to do is change target.x and target.y to different values. Let's try a basic example. Here, let's just say target.x equals, I don't know, 500, and target.y equals 400. If I save and run, if I were to click on the target, we can see that the target jumps to a different position. It doesn't change anymore after that. If I were to keep clicking on it, it keeps jumping to this 500-400 position. That's why this game would vastly improve with some randomness. Lua comes with a math.random function. Using this, we can generate a random value. And we can assign this value to the coordinates of the target. This would put it in a random, unexpected position. 
Now there are several ways to use this function, but the best way for this situation is to provide a minimum and maximum value. So let's try this out. For target.x, let's say math.random. And like I said, we need to provide a minimum value. Let's make a minimum value of 0 and a maximum value of 100. And let's actually copy this and do the same thing for target.y. What these lines mean is that when we increase the score, we're also going to change the x position of the target to some number between 0 and 100, some random number. Same thing for target.y. It'll be some random number between 0 and 100. Let's save and run and try this out. So I'm going to click on the target once, and it jumps up here. I'm going to click on it again. It moves a little bit. It keeps jumping to random positions, but it's isolated to this really small area in the upper left-hand corner. That's because we defined the random values to be between 0 to 100 pixels and 0 to 100 pixels. So there's just a small box up here. Ideally, we would want this range to extend from the whole left side of the screen to the whole right side of the screen, and the whole top of the screen to the whole bottom, meaning it would jump to anywhere on our game window. So in order to accomplish that, instead of going from a random value of 0 to 100, we'll go some random value between 0 and the screen width, this whole width of the screen. Same with height, 0 to the whole height of the screen. And we can get those values very easily. We can simply change this 100 to love.graphics.get width with two parentheses. This call right here gets the width of our game window in pixels, which is perfect. And we can do the same for our target.y, love.graphics.get height with two parentheses. This will get the height of our game window in pixels. So go ahead and save and run now, and let's try this out. Now it's jumping all over the place. It can jump to any point on the screen. Now I want to address a very small issue that will help with polishing our game up. You see right here, the circle kind of went off screen a little bit. And there's an expected reason for this. The X and Y position of the target is the center of the circle right here. So if the circle can go anywhere from 0, the very, very top of the screen, to the height of the screen, the very, very bottom, that means that this center point could potentially be right on the edge, making half of the circle inaccessible. So this means if we want to keep the circle completely visible on screen, we should adjust this range slightly. So how can we adjust these random ranges here to prevent that from happening? Well, we know the radius of the circle, target.radius. So if we make sure that there's at least a radius length between the center points of the circle and the edge of the screen, we'll know that the circle is always completely visible. With this in mind, we could just change this 0 to target.radius. So since target.radius is 50, that means that this random range is from 50 to whatever the width of the screen is. And we can actually do the same thing for our y position, target.radius. So doing this takes care of the left side of the screen. The circle will never get so close to this left edge or this top edge that it will become slightly hidden. However, it is still possible that since we're going all the way to the edge here and this bottom edge, that it could go off screen somewhat there. To fix that, we just need to adjust this final value. If we decrease target.radius from this top value, same here, target.radius, that will prevent the circle from going off screen at all. So with this, we can play the game, and now we can know with confidence that the target will always be 100% visible each time we press on the target. We've only scratched the surface of what we can do with this game framework, and there's still plenty of things we could do with this simple game that we created just to flesh it out a bit more. If you'd like to dive deeper into this framework, be sure to check out my full course on Udemy, Lua Programming, and Game Development with Love. This course features all of the footage from this video, 
but with so much additional content. We add more to the game from this video, where we include real graphics to it, create a main menu, and have a timer that counts down. From there, we go on to create two full additional games, first being a top-down shooter, then moving on to a platformer game. There's also two dedicated sections talking about deploying a web game with love and creating mobile games. There's a link in the description to this course where you can find more information about all of the topics covered. Also, using this link will automatically apply a discount code. And by the way, all Udemy courses come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving the course a try. If you have any questions, leave a comment on this video. And if you like this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more game development content. Thanks a lot for watching.